Hello, and welcome to the History of the Germans, the Prologue, Part 1. So this is the very first episode of what I hope will become a weekly podcast on German history. What I'm planning to do is to take you from the year 919 AD, when the first real king of the Germans, a gentleman by the name of Henry the Fowler, was crowned in Fritzlar, all the way down to the day of German reunification on October 3rd, 1990. I have no idea how long this will take me, but given there is an unbelievable amount of material to get through, it will take me a while before you hear the words, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down that wall. I initially wanted to start the podcast with the invasion by the Cimbri and the Teutones in around 110 BC and then work my way up from there. But there's a problem with that. There are actually two problems. First, I'm old and I'm slow. So if I want to get to the post-war period during my lifetime, I have to cut something out. And secondly, the Germanic tribes that invaded the Roman Empire are by definition not the ancestors of the modern Germans, right? These barbarian hordes have actually left Germany and they settled in Italy and in Spain and in France and in North Africa. And that means the descendants of these fierce Teutonic warriors that are today's fashionable Milanese and the sophisticated Parisians and the food-obsessed Catalans. On the other hand, the ancestors of your sausage-eating Berliners and my ancestors, they were the peace-loving settled Germans who preferred reading poetry playing music instead of raiding and pillaging. So, that is why the podcast starts properly in the year 919, leaving out a thousand years of history. But leaving this much time out completely is also not that simple. Some of you are familiar with the Germanic invasions and the Dark Ages and the rise and the decline of the Carolingian Empire, and if that is you, that's great. Go straight to episode one and I'm sure you'll have a great time. But most of us are not that familiar with the political and the cultural and social environment in the early 10th century and just require a bit of a refresher and background. That is where these three prologue episodes come in. They're a super condensed summary of what happened before our story really gets going. There will be a roller coaster ride, 15 years a minute, and I apologize for all the omissions and errors that will follow. Okay, and a waffle, saddle up. And let's see whether we can get from Julius Caesar to the end of the Western Roman Empire in 20 minutes. Germany was invented by Julius Caesar. When Julius Caesar started his genocidal invasion of Gaul in 58 BC, there weren't really actually profound cultural differences between the peoples living east or west of the Rhine. Caesar's plan was really only to defeat the Gauls. Because the Gauls, they were the eternal bogeyman of pre-imperial Rome. They, the Gauls, had sacked the eternal city in 387 BC. It's beating the Gauls that will bring him glory and wealth. What will bring him nothing, no glory, no wealth, is getting bogged down in some impenetrable swampy forest east of the Rhine. So, in order to declare the Gauls defeated, Caesar stated that the people east of the Rhine just weren't Gauls. They were Germans. Problem solved. So 60 years later, the perspective has changed a bit. So the Gauls, you know, they Romanized very quickly. They sent senators to Rome. They were almost indistinguishable from Italians. With that in mind, Augustus thought maybe if we can get the Germans to become like the Gauls, there would be wealth and glory in that swampy forest after all. So he sent his stepson Tiberius into Germany to take a shufti. And Tiberius marched all the way down the Elbe River. He knocked down local tribes wherever he went. So one of those tribes the Romans defeated were the Cheruski. And in time-honored tradition, they took their young prince, a young Arminius, down to Rome as a hostage. The idea was to show this impressionable young man the power and the wealth and the culture of Rome, so they would go back to his tribe and tell everybody there's no point in fighting these far superior peoples. And Arminius, he was either mightily impressed with what he saw, or he was a mightily good actor, 
But in any event, so he applied for Roman citizenship and was accepted into the army as an officer. In the year 8 AD, Arminius returned to Germany and he joined the staff of the commander of the Rhine legions, a certain Publius Quintilius Varus. I guess some of you may have heard the name before and so you know what will be coming now. Many a general have made a bad recruitment decision, but I think Varus is really in the top decile of people getting the wrong guy in. So Varus did not have to wait for very long before the error of his judgment became clear. In the autumn of the following year, after a spot of gentle plundering and other ways of spreading the Pax Romana, Varus found himself in a forest, somewhere east of the Rhine, heading back to his winter camp near Cologne. There he received note that one of the previously defeated tribes was rising up again. Varus was probably a bit irritated, but he turned his three legions round to sort that problem out. And Arminius, he's always the keen young officer, he came up and he said, I'm going to go and get you some auxiliary troops from my tribe, and he left his camp. And a few days later, he returned. No longer Arminius, the Roman officer and gentleman, but as Hermann the German at the head of an army. That could not have happened at a worse moment for Varus. Did I mention that Germany was an impenetrable swampy forest with few, if any, roads and paths through? Yep, that is why Caesar did not linger there. For Varus, that insight came too late. His army had followed one of these narrow paths through the forest in search of the rebels. By the time the Germans arrived, his army of 20,000 soldiers had stretched out along this path in a column some say was 20 kilometers long. The Germans hid in the forest either side of the path and attacked the column. Some say that despite the disadvantage and the heavy rainfall, the Romans were able to set up a fortified camp for the night. It doesn't matter, because the next morning they were again on that same path with the Germans harassing them all the way. The Roman advance, or this was probably more of a flight, came to an end when they reached a hill called the Chalky Giant. At that point, Varus was left with three options. He could either follow the path that led along the foot of the hill and had a bog on the other side. Alternatively, he could try to get over the hill and finally he could turn around and run the same gauntlet of Germans again. Nobody really fancied option three, so they tried and scaled the chalky giant, but when that failed, they settled for option one. Option one was the one Hermann had planned for. His troops had dug a deep trench across the path just ahead of the Roman army. When the Romans reached the trench, their advance stopped. As the rear of the army caught up, it became exceedingly cramped on that narrow path. And that made it really easy for the Germans. They were sitting up on the slopes of the hill and they were firing arrows and spears down onto the Romans. Being packed together tightly, they could barely raise their weapons. So some tried to escape through the bog and they drowned. The cavalry ran away, but was caught by the rear of the German army. Nearly all the 20,000 Roman soldiers died. Varus and his senior officers committed suicide. Augustus wailed in his palace, and the Romans never dared to attack such mighty warriors again. Well, if you read the German historians of the 19th century, that's the story, but um, no. They might have built a 55 meter high monument to Hermann the German in the Teutoburger Forest in his honor. It's 10 meters taller than the Statue of Liberty. It might have been a triumph of German engineering, but not really a triumph of German geography since it was built 100 kilometers south of the site of the actual battle. Truth is, Hermann did not free the Germans. It was only a small subset of German tribes that had come to fight with Arminius. Despite the huge success of the battle, hardly anyone joined his coalition in the years that followed. Maybe they knew what was coming. What, or more precisely who, was coming was Germanicus, nephew of Emperor Tiberius, father of Caligula, 
and the most capable member of the Julio-Claudian dynasty of his generation. Germanicus led the Romans back into Germany with eight legions and hit Arminius and his allies hard. Arminius was killed by his own people in 20 AD and with that the Rhine frontier became peaceful for the next 150 years or so. The Romans made sure that Germany was ruled by client kings who had more interest in fighting each other than in threatening the border. There is a debate why Germanicus ended his campaign in 16 AD and why the Romans did not fully incorporate Germany into the empire either then or at a later stage. First, I think they just did not find much of value in the heavily forested and sparsely populated lands of Germany. As far as they knew, there was nothing but forest from here until the end of the world. Therefore, if you must defend the empire against whatever might come out of that endless forest in the future, the Rhine is a lot easier to hold than the Elbe. If troops were deployed from, say, Spain or Italy into Germany, they would normally sail by boat to Marseille and then go up the Rhone and Saone rivers via Lyon and Besançon to Strasbourg, where they reached the Rhine frontier. A border on the Elbe would have added another 300 and 400 kilometers of marching through empty territory unless you wanted to bring the supplies over the Alps. Whatever it was, the Roman advance ended here and there. They set up border defences along the western shore of the Rhine, from Amsterdam down to the modern city of Mainz. And from Mainz, they built a 550 kilometre long fortified wall all the way down to Regensburg on the Danube. So just for comparison, this is five times longer than Hadrian's Wall in England. Within this part of Germany, the Romans founded several cities, including Cologne, Trier, Mainz, Augsburg and Regensburg. These are names you will hear in the upcoming episodes many, many times. So what do we know about these Germans? Very little is the answer. They lived in small villages and clearings inside that enormous forest. Their economy was predominantly agricultural. They did some impressive metalworks they exported into the Roman Empire, which may explain why you have so many smiths in Wagner's operas. About their culture, religion, language, customs, we have some Roman sources, namely Tacitus. How much we should trust him? It's a bit up in the air. He never went to Germany. His main objective was really to tell off his degenerate compatriots rather than to advance anthropology. The Germans themselves left no written records of the time. What we can infer from the Germanic law codes, which were passed later, when they had conquered most of the Roman Empire, is that they had an evolved and complex legal system. That was in many ways the diametrical opposite of the Roman law of the empire. Determination and application of the law was provided by the Ting. The Ting is an assembly of free men, and in some tribes, including the free women. They would hear mostly criminal cases, but the Ting also elects their leader and king. That did not mean the society was equal or democratic in any modern sense. Members of the nobility had more say in the decision-making than simple free men, and even within the nobility, different individuals held more power than others. But compare that to the later Roman Empire, where the emperor decided not just where you lived or died, but even what job you could have and who you could marry, and there were no constraints whatsoever. Criminal cases were dominated by the concept of compensation. Unlawful killing was punished by paying a fine, most of which went to the aggrieved party, i.e. the family of the victim, though some of it went to the king. The fine depended on the rank of the individual, with simple free men costing, say, 200 shillings, noblemen 600 shillings, wife of a nobleman double that, i.e. 1200 shillings, and so on. The death penalty was reserved for two crimes, treason and rape. Traitors were hanged and rapists were drowned in the bog. The Ting would determine the guilt and the level of compensation. This model is the forerunner of jury trials we have in the Anglo-Saxon world. In the Roman tradition, which is the basis of modern German law, the judge determines the guilt and the punishment. Another Germanic concept is the common land, 
i.e. the land that is used by all members of the community based on some sharing mechanism. So next time you take a walk on Wimbledon Common or on Boston Common for that matter, remember that Germanic law lives more in the Anglo-Saxon world today than it does in Germany itself. Germanic religious beliefs are shrouded in mystery. Caesar described them as having no priests, no gods, they're just worshipping natural phenomena. But then we know why Caesar wants us to believe they're different from the Gauls. I mean, Caesar also believed that moose had no knees, and that therefore they slept leaning against the trees, and that the Germans would catch them by cutting down the trees so they would fall over. Archaeological finds indicate that there was a huge variety of beliefs, some Celtic in origin, and some more relating to Norse mythology. But there were also specific German beliefs, like the cult of the goddess Nertus, who travelled around in a closed wagon, and wherever she went, they would have a party in her honour. And whenever the goddess got tired of people, the wagon would stop and it would be ceremoniously washed. That tradition lives on in both the love parades and the habit of washing your car every Saturday or Sunday. We do not know whether all Germans believed in Valhalla, a Nordic heaven where fallen warriors would drink and fight for eternity, but they were definitely not afraid to die in battle. Living in clearings in the forest, the economy of Germania was extremely fragile. So Germanic warriors found themselves quite regularly surplus to requirement in their home village and went off to plunder. Initially, these would be just small groups who went out for a summer or two, but when pressures were high and persistent, these small groups started to join up and become ever larger groups. These large groups often developed their own identity, sometimes linked to the original tribe of some of their early members, and sometimes it was entirely made up from scratch. Most of the plundering happened between Germanic villages, but when the groups had become too large, they started to migrate out of Germany. Before the Romans had built their defensive walls, the preferred destination of these warbands was Gaul. One of the better known warbands were the Cimbri and the Teutones, who threatened Rome during the consulship of Marius in 104 BC. But after Caesar's conquests of Gaul, no warband crossed into Roman territory until the 160s AD. We are not sure what started the Great Migration, or Völkerwanderung as it's called in German. Most probably it was a combination of climate change and growth in population that had pushed a large number of men and their wives and their children into a life of endless movement and war. In 160 AD, Rome was ruled by the five good emperors, and so these German war bands considered it suicide to attack the Roman fortifications. So they could not go west. Neither going north to Sweden or east to Russia looked particularly appealing. They headed south into the Balkans and the Volga Delta. Moving through, they kept diligently east of the Danube frontier. This group were the famous Goths, who would later break up into the Visigoths, the Ostrogoths and the Vandals. Whilst the Goths were for now well behaved towards the Romans, they were not so nice to other tribes they encountered en route. One of those they met were the Marcomanni, a settled group living just across the Roman walls in what is now Bavaria, Czech Republic and Hungary. The Marcomanni found themselves squeezed between the Goths in their back and the Romans in front. I guess they tossed a coin to decide which way to die and it came up heads for Rome. So in the late 160s the Marcomanni attacked the Danube frontier, beat a Roman army at Canutum and marched into Italy. Now this is the first time an enemy has set foot on Italian soil for 300 years. You can imagine, the sirens are going off all over the place. The Romans mobilize all they have, and Marcus Aurelius and his favorite general, Maximus Decimus Meridius, beat the Marcomanni back. Marcus Aurelius subsequently dies, his son and successor Commodus has other interests, and as we all know, Maximus Decimus Meridius becomes a gladiator. 
Well, I guess you've all seen the movie. It is really a great show, just a lot of alternative facts, above all when it comes to the ending. Yes, Commodus was killed by a conspiracy, but not in the arena, but in his bath, and not by a gladiator, but by a girlfriend. And most importantly, his death did not lead to a return of the ancient Roman Republic led by Derek Jacobi. Instead, it resulted in the year of the five emperors, one of whom simply bought the imperial crown at auction from the Praetorian Guard. What followed is known as the crisis of the 3rd century that brought Rome close to collapse. The emperors Aurelian, Diocletian and Constantine managed to stabilise the empire in the 4th century, but that came at a heavy price. The Roman Empire had a major problem during the 3rd and 4th century, and that was a shortage of soldiers. The old model of free Roman citizens serving in the legions had gone out of fashion under Consul Marius hundreds of years ago. Roman armies consisted of professional soldiers who signed up for pay and loot. Recruitment had become more and more difficult. The upper classes had created enormous estates that used large numbers of indentured servants as labour. These indentured servants may well have wanted to get away and join the legions, but their owners did not like it. So, every time the army recruiters arrived at the farm, the strongest workers were miraculously busy on the other side of the estate, and only the lazy, the old or the infirm were offered up. The city dwellers may have been free, but had become so used to be fed and entertained at the Empress' expense that serving in the muddy fields of Germany did not sound like fun. Syria? Okay. Germania? No way. So, Emperor Aurelian invited groups of Germanic warriors, Franks, Goths, Burgundians, etc., to come and settle in the Roman Empire and join the legions. Diocletian and Constantine further reformed the system of border defences. They stationed the proper Roman legions in the major cities further inland. The Germanic warriors became the first line of defence. Their job was to hold off their country cousins from across the Rhine and the Danube until the big guys arrive. The use of Germanic troops went through the roof when in 324 Emperor Constantine fought a civil war with his core Augustus Licinius. Constantine's army of nearly 130,000 soldiers is said to have consisted predominantly of Frankish warriors, whilst Licinius, who had an even larger army which consisted mainly of Goths. It's almost as if the Roman civil wars had turned into some sort of intra-Germanic struggle. The Germanification of the Roman legions shouldn't have been anything unusual in Roman history. Since at least the end of the Republic, Roman legions consisted of people from anywhere in the Empire. For instance, you can find gravestones of Roman officers in England who were born in Syria or North Africa. The big difference is that the Syrians, the Illyrians and the North Africans were fully integrated into the Roman Empire and they could achieve the highest ranks. I mean, Hadrian and Trajan were Spanish and Aurelian and Diocletian were Croatians. But that was not the case with the Germans. The Romans refused to integrate the German warriors. Must be something about the lack of sense of humour. Moreover, the Germans liked to remain with their tribe, their customs and their kings, rather than being dispersed and Romanized. And after the Battle of Adrianople in 378, when the Goths destroyed a Roman army and killed the Emperor Valens, the Romans could no longer stop them from staying with their tribe, their customs and their kings, but now inside the empire. Germans could become generals, they could even become Magister Militium, the highest rank in the army, but they could not enter the senatorial class, they could not become consul and they certainly could not become emperor. But as we history buffs know too well, the guys who control the sharp and pointy things tend to be the ones who give the orders in the end. And that is what happened. In the last century of the Western Roman Empire, Germanic generals, like Stilicho and Ricimer, they were running things and they are using their emperors just as puppets. 
Therefore, the picture of the Germanic invasions where burly blokes with silly haircuts scale the border defences and hit the clean-shaven Roman legionnaires over the head is simply wrong. The Germans who were scaling the walls were the cousins of those defending the walls. The only difference was that the defenders had a green card and the attackers wanted one. This system was obviously unsustainable and ended in a palace coup in 476 when one of these Germanic generals, a certain Odoacer, entered the Emperor Romulus Augustus chamber and told him that his services were no longer required. And that is where the Western Roman Empire and this episode come to an end. But this is not the end of the prologue. In the next episode, which is already online, you can hear about the decline into the Dark Ages proper, the rise of Clovis I and his Merovingian Empire. We will meet Charles the Hammer Martel, and we follow the mayors of the palace until the coronation of Pippin the Short as king of all the Franks. I hope you will join us. <laughs>